Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another public lecture by the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies, this time in conjunction with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Embassy of Mexico. Uh, we are waiting on the ambassador in Mexico, but uh, she's caught in uh, what appears to be a car accident, not her car accident, but uh, is held up as a result fairly close to here, but she'll be here fairly shortly. Uh, tonight we have uh, a public lecture of, I think, very considerable importance about Mexico and Mexico's foreign relationships. Mexico is, of course, one of the two giants of Latin America, along with Brazil, and increasingly is emerging as an important and major player in international relations and in international political economy. And the topic of tonight's lecture is Mexico and changing global governance environment, because many of the changes that have taken place in the last little while affected Mexico in profound ways, the impact of the global financial crisis, of course, the impact of cross-border movements and people, uh, and of goods, the impact of global free trade agreements such as NAFTA and many other things. And Mexico has been really at, uh, in the eye of the tornado of many of those events. And tonight, uh, it's my great uh, privilege to welcome to speak about these questions, Dr. Rafael Fernandez de Castro. Um, Dr. Fernandez is a very distinguished scholar in Mexico of international reputation. He uh, held a uh, bachelor's degree in social science from ITAM, the institute of which he is now a part, the Mexican Institute, Autonomous Institute of Technology. He uh, holds a master's from the University of Texas at Austin and a PhD from Georgetown. Uh, in addition, he is, and uh, most importantly at the moment, the founder, the uh, director, and the full, a full professor in the Department of International Relations at ITAM. So he is a very important uh, scholar, uh, particularly in relation to Mexico's bilateral relationship with the United States and Mexico's foreign policy. In addition, he's played a very important role in public policy between 2008 and now. He has been a senior advisor to Felipe Calderon, the president of Mexico. Uh, Dr. Fernandez has said that he doesn't want to speak for a, a very long period, but rather would extend, uh, prefer to extend the time in which there is time for discussion and questions. So he'll speak for perhaps 20, 25 minutes or something like that, and then there will be more than enough time for people to contribute to asking questions and to continue the discussion. And of course, as always at Anquist Public Lectures, the period following the formal discussion, the formal meeting, is just as important as the period during it, and there'll be refreshments and so on served in the foyer afterwards, and plenty of opportunity for less formal discussion. Once again, would you please welcome Dr. Fernandez de Castro. Thank you, John. Thank you, John Means, for having me here, and, uh, and thank you to the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies. Uh, I know that I'm between, uh, I mean, after my lecture, there's going to be good margaritas and tequila, no, <laughs> no refreshment out there, but I, I intend to talk uh, no more than 20, 25 minutes, uh, because I'll be uh, delighted in, in, in engaging in conversation with you, having more of a dialogue than, 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 uh, than a monologue of, of, my, of myself. Yes, for the last three years, I've been the foreign policy advisor for, for President Calderon. I quit my position a few weeks ago because uh, I was going to lose my tenure in my university, and I've been in my university for 18 years, and I decided to, to, it was too costly to continue to be uh, working for President Calderon. But I had a fascinating uh, experience working for him. Uh, uh, during three years, I made every single foreign trip that he did, uh, with one exception. I didn't go to, to South Africa to the, to the Soccer World Cup <laughs> last summer. And basically, because I know that my seat in the plane was highly appreciated by, every, by everybody in the cabinet, and I decided to, to, to give it up. I was sick. I, the month before, we, had, we made a very hard tour. We went to, in a month, we went two days uh, to Germany, uh, uh, May 1st and 2nd. Uh, we had a meeting on, on climate change, and uh, President Calderon was preparing the 
COP16, the, 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 the conference of the parties that we held in Cancun last December. Then, that month, 10 days after that, we went back to, to Spain uh, because we had two important meetings in Spain. One with the uh, presidency of the European Union and then the, the European Union Latin American Heads of State uh, meeting. And, uh, and then we flew back from, uh, from Madrid uh, to Washington and we paid a state, a state visit to President Obama. I tell you two very intense days. Uh, it's it's uh, and a state visit to Washington for every single world leader. It's, 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 it's a lot of business. <laughs> and, uh, and then we came back to Mexico and we came the same month to, to, to Canada to a state visit uh, to Ottawa and, uh, and to Toronto. And we, all, and we ended up uh, in Boston with, with President Calderon made the commencement speech at the Kennedy School uh, of Politics. So it was a, a tremendous month. And, uh, and, uh, and I want basically to talk here about Mexican foreign affairs, the role that Mexico is playing in the world. Uh, but before I do that, let me uh, say two things about Mexico. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Mexican democracy, then a little bit about the Mexican economy, and then uh, fully engage in, in, in the the role we play in, in world affairs. Uh, the, by the way, the, the result of the census uh, of 2010 just came out a month ago, and it's telling us that Mexico is now the, the number 10 country in the world in terms of population. There's 112 million Mexicans, and the average age of Mexicans, of the Mexicans it's uh, 26, 26 years. We're, we're aging very rapidly. Uh, and nowadays, uh, it's, uh, we still have a lot of young population that's finishing very soon. And we know that we have to take, I mean, this is a, the next 15 years or so are very important for Mexico because we really have to catch up economically. And uh, uh, I'm, I, I don't know how much uh, aware are you about Mexican politics, but Mexico basically inaugurated democracy only 11 years ago. It was in the year 2000 with the coming of President Vicente Fox into the presidency when he was able to get rid of, of the PRI, of the, the, the National Revolutionary Institutional Party, the PRI, <coughs> it's a Spanish acronym. This party was in power in Mexico for 71 years. And uh, it was an authoritarian party. And, uh, but it was not the end of the world. It was a party that throughout 70 years was able to build a lot of institutions in Mexico. We have, for example, a very good uh, social safety network. We have fairly good uh, university system. So it was not the end of the world. It was a party that, well, had formal elections, but not, it was not a very good election. But for Latin American standards, we did not, I mean, it was, uh, the PRI was not the end of the world. It was authoritarian, yes, it was not a com not competitive election. But, uh, but finally, in the year 2000, uh, and Vicente Fox, who was uh, campaigning for two or three years, he was the governor of the central state of Guanajuato, and someone who was a great campaign campaigner. He ran a, a campaign uh, with, the, with the methods of change, that we got enough of this authoritarian system, and, uh, and he got uh, elected in July 2000, and we Mexicans felt very proud of this accomplishment, because it was a peaceful transition to democracy, and, 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 and I'm telling you this because I want you to have a, a clear picture of what Mexico. Mexico is an infant democracy, let's put it in that way. Nowadays we have, of course, a, a, a separation of powers. Uh, Congress has become, and is becoming a very powerful institution. Uh, but it only has been 11 years in which uh, Congress is it's, uh, it's independent from the executive branch, uh, so you have to bear this in mind. It's, uh, we, we cannot ask many things to Congress. We still have a lot of institutional development and strength and, uh, and a lot of institutional building to do in Congress because it's, it's only been for 11 years 
bear that in mind, uh, an independent branch from the executive. And also we have a very independent now court system, uh, especially in the high court, but still we have a long way to develop our, our judicial system uh, with lagging behind. And, uh, so this is an infant democracy, but in which uh, we're enjoying a lot of freedom. I mean, the, for example, it is truly fascinating to observe, I mean, the, the press freedom in Mexico. I mean, if you see all the criticism to President Calderón, all the criticism to the government, it's, you can tell that this is a, a true democracy, and this is brand new, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't have that uh, freedom of expression. So nowadays Mexico is fully free on that. I, I vividly remember uh, the spring of uh, 2009, when Mexico was facing the flu H1N1 crisis. Uh, uh, it was a flu that we didn't know that, that, I mean, how deadly the, the new virus was and how contagious it was. But Mexico and the government of Mexico handled it, uh, I would say, with a lot of responsibility uh, and in a very transparent and democratic way. And every single foreign correspondent coming into Mexico, they, they ended up praise, praising Mexico and uh, praising President Calderón's uh, government because he handled the a very delicate issue for the world, not only for Mexico, in a very democratic way. We were informing what was happening in Mexico twice a day, uh, truly with a lot of transparency and that. And if there were any doubt that Mexico was a full democracy, with that happening, everybody realized that Mexico now is, is a true democracy. We have a very competitive electoral system, although elections are very expensive in Mexico, and still we lack some order in elections because, uh, for example, the sharp contrast with the U.S. that only every two years they have elections in Mexico, our electoral calendar still spread throughout the the year, and, and every year there's at least a few uh, state contests, and, uh, and we don't really have put a lot of order into this, but, but the system is very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's expensive, but this is an expense that Mexico decided to, to have, uh, just to make sure that this is going to be an independent wrong electoral system, and, it's, and we have at least Electoral Institute, which is has a huge budget from the government, but it praises itself to be very independent from, from, from the central government, and, and it is very independent. So I'll stop here just to let you know that we're a full democracy, but this is a new democracy. In terms of, 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 uh, of the economy, Mexico is a very open economy. Uh, and this is a fairly new economy. <coughs> All the way up till the 1980s, Mexico was a very close economy, but uh, uh, the Mexican government decided to, 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 to change the economic model and to, and to go about an export-oriented economy. And Mexico is succeeding in doing that. And for doing that, uh, Mexico decided to negotiate a lot of free trade agreements. And, uh, the single most important one was NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We started negotiating this agreement in 1991. It was a, a big accomplishment of Mexico because in doing that, we certainly have opened the US market for Mexican exports. And thanks to NAFTA, in a seven year period, exports, Mexican exports to the US triple. Nowadays, we have a, a two way trade with the US of about 30 of about $300 billion, so it's a huge, uh, uh, I mean, the, the trade between Mexico and the U.S. It, 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 it's approaching a billion dollar in a daily basis, so it's a, it's a huge trade system between Mexico and the U.S., but it comes to a price. Mexico is very dependent on the U.S. economy. 80% of Mexican exports go to the U.S., and it's, 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 so we depend a lot on the U.S. economy, and since the U.S. economy in the last three to four years, they're not doing that well. Well, Mexico is suffering, and that's why the Mexican economy has suffered. So uh, it's 
has shown not in last year, no last year, not this year, but the previous three years, we have this sluggish uh, growth in the Mexican economy because we're very tied to the U.S. economic cycle. Uh, but it's uh, interesting to note that Mexico has a free trade agreement with have, has 12 free trade agreements with 46, 47 countries. The single most important is NAFTA. But we have an important free trade agreement with the European Union. And, um, and what I can say is that lately, in the last three or four years, and this is really something of the last three or four years, uh, there's an exhaustion of, of free trade in Mexico. Uh, it's, um, Mexico opening, open up its economy a lot because of NAFTA, because of all the other trade agreements. And now there's a little bit of second thought, especially in the private sector. And I will say that the private sector and the big business, they have become a bit protectionist. Uh, one of the very important uh, agreements that President Calderón is trying to, 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 to negotiate, it's a free trade agreement with Brazil. And, uh, and uh, he and, and President Lula announced this agreement uh, a year and a half ago. And we have not yet started negotiations because it's, uh, it's uh, in the, private, the Mexican private sector is, is resisting and, uh, and it's putting a lot of obstacles uh, in, in, into, the, in, in, into the negotiation. And, uh, and, uh, and this is just to give you a sense of, of where things are now in terms of, of, of the economy. And, uh, this year the economy will grow at 4.5 percent. It's fairly good by by North American standards because the U.S. will grow at about 2.2 percent, 2.5 percent. But Mexico is lagging behind of in terms of, of growth uh, in comparison to other Latin American economies, especially Brazil, that has been growing at the rate of 5 or 6 percent in the last few years. And Mexico had a, very, a terrible year in, in 2000. And nine, Mexico had a contraction of almost close to seven percent. I mean, the, the economic uh, uh, slowdown and the, the economic crisis of 2009 really hit Mexico. And why? Because we're very close, and we're, I mean, we're very close to the economic cycle of the U.S. But Mexico is, is very open. Uh, we have a, an average uh, trade uh, tariff of close to 4.5 percent, it's very low by world standards, and in the midst of the 2009 crisis, and nine crisis, instead of closing the Mexican economy, Mexico decided to unilaterally continue to uh, lower down uh, tariffs, so Mexico truly believes in, in free markets, and, uh, and uh, even though the private sector is a little bit uneasy about that. And um, the single most important problem of Mexico in terms of economic growth is, of course, the, the gap between the, the rich Mexicans and the, and the poor Mexicans. And that's been, the, that's been the, the problem of Mexico forever, and, uh, and, uh, and it continues to be the case. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, expectations about NAFTA, creating more wealth in Mexico, and indeed it has created much more wealth in Mexico, but that has not been able to close the gap between the, the rich and the poor Mexicans. Uh, we still have a good 45% uh, of Mexican population uh, living in, in below uh, uh, poverty, in, in poverty levels, and, uh, and it's, it's huge. And uh, although the good news coming in the recent census is that now most Mexicans and truly most Mexicans, about 80% of Mexicans, they feel the middle classes. And uh, the aspirations now of, of, of almost every single Mexican is to be a middle class person. And they have been, they, they exercise middle class values, which helps a lot. And, uh, and now, for example, Mexico, thanks to the, the cellular phones, Mexico is very well connected. There's more than one million cellulars in Mexico. So that means that now Mexico is connected, which is which could be of a lot of help. And we're still lagging behind, for example, in the number of Mexicans having a bank account and things like that. Uh, now let me go to, 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 to foreign policy. I would say that uh, there's 
three main challenges of, uh, in, in, in world affairs for Mexico. And, and, uh, and this is how President Calderon sees world affairs. I mean, the number one challenge is the US. Yes, it's our northern neighbor. We share 3,200 uh, kilometers of uh, border with the US. It's a huge border. I mean, there's a very nice uh, saying of, of, of Mexico. It's, uh, this, is, this is to tell you how sometimes when Mexicans feel about the neighbors of the US. I mean, there was a very well known saying in Mexico. That, uh, that uh, apparently it was Porfirio Diaz who was a Mexican president, eventually dictator, for 30 years. He governed Mexico from the uh, night from the 1880s to 1910, uh, when uh, and the Mexican Revolution was against him. And his, and what well, he coined the phrase "Poor Mexico." so close to the U.S. and so far from God. And then some Israelis being in Mexico, they, they say, well, I mean, we feel sorry for Israel, so close to God and so far away from the U.S. And, uh, because it continues to be the largest market in the world. But the problem is that, I mean, we, I mean if, we, if, we, if, we were to, if we were to have perhaps 500 uh, kilometers border, we could manage to, to have <laughs> a 2,000 mile border with the U.S. is very complicated, especially with this USA uh, that uh, has decided to control the border, and the border in the past was a very open border, and it's now very complicated to try to seal the border because it's, it's impossible to seal all of this uh, with all the technology and with all the resources that the U.S. has put into it, it's, it's almost impossible to see the border. And it's certainly bringing a lot of problems to the people living around the border. There's about 10 million Mexicans and 6, and 6 million Americans living close to the border. And the new security uh, forces operating in the border it, it has brought a lot of problems there. But basically, I mean, what are the challenges, uh, the, the big challenges with the U.S.? I would say there's three main challenges with the U.S. The number one is we must accomplish fairly soon what I would call a, a true security partnership. We don't yet have a, a, a truly security partnership with the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and what I'm talking about a security partnership is something that is very different from what Australia or Canada has been having with the U.S. Australia and Canada, you've been fighting wars with the U.S. You've been key military and strategic allies to the U.S. What I mean with, an, with, a, with a, a, a security partnership with the U.S. is about securing the border is about having a border that allows for, that is that is efficient in terms of of allowing Mexican goods to come into, into the US and about Mexican goods American goods to come into Mexico but about being very effective also in not allowing drugs from Mexico coming into the US and not allowing arms from the US coming into Mexico. And, uh, a security partnership in which the U.S. truly exercise uh, shared responsibility in the Mexican war against organized crime and against drug traffickers. Um, we have a huge problem in Mexico of organized crime, which was truly that started really in the U.S. because of the U.S. drug consumption. The U.S. continues to have the largest market for drugs and. Uh, and the profits of the Mexican cartels are enormous. We're talking about easily about thirty billion dollars a year. So it's it's, it's I mean, having those uh, kind of of, of, uh, of economic benefits and uh, it's, it's very difficult for, for the Mexican government to try to control that. And the U.S. is doing very little to help Mexico in this. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in the last few years. Mexic President Calderón decided at the outset of his administration in early 2007 uh, to break what I would say was the golden rule of Mexican diplomacy with the U.S., which was 
we will not ask the U.S. for foreign aid because if we ask America or Washington for foreign aid, we're going to be subject of, of a greater scrutiny by the U.S. Congress. So we didn't want U.S. help on this. Let me just give you a sense. In the year, in the year 2006, Mexico, Mexico received only $40 million in U.S. Okay. And thanks to the Merida initiative that it was put out by President Calderon and President Bush, that uh, money multiplied, uh, was increased by 10 times. So now we're supposed to be receiving $400, $400 million a year. Still, it's nothing of what Mexico needs. But, to, but let me give you a, a sense of how we feel now. Well, we negotiated the Merida initiative. So we decided to, to broke the golden rule of Mexico. Now there's a lot of frustration in Mexico because in the last four years, the U.S. should have sent to Mexico $1.4 billion into Mexico in help to combat organized crime and to combat drug traffickers. I'll tell you, not even 300 million have come to Mexico. So we bought. So we're not really getting the resources out of the U.S., but we're getting the, scru the scrutiny of the U.S. And every single U.S. congressman feels uh, that they should, uh, that they could really bash Mexico and tell us what to do because we're using U.S. Tax taxpayers' money in combating organization in Mexico. So I guess we're getting the stick and not the carrot of the U.S. aid in, in combating organized crime. So we have. We have to, to truly uh, come uh, uh, and, and, uh, and make sure that we're going to have a, a security partnership with the U.S. And the U.S. has promised and has pledged that they will help, that, they will, that this is their war against organized crime in Mexico. But they not put in their act together. Still, they have a, there's a lot of red tape in the U.S. to get uh, aid to Mexico. And this is causing a lot of problems, a lot of frictions. Nowadays, we're really having a tremendous a lot of frictions with the U.S. because the, the resources are not coming, and again, the scrutiny is there. The second challenge with the U.S. is about, I mean, NAFTA was operate, wonder, operated wonderful. The, the, the first uh, NAFTA went into effect in 1994, and for the first seven years, it did very, very well. It, it, triple the number of exports of Mexico to the U.S. Uh, nowadays, Mexico is the third largest exporter to the U.S. And Mexico, the Mexican market is the second market of destination for U.S. exports. So if we're talking big numbers here. Uh, we represent about the 12% of, of international trade for the U.S. Uh, uh, this, uh, behind Canada and behind China, but very close to China because we're bigger exporters than China. Uh, we're a bigger importer than China, and China is a bigger exporter than, than we are. Uh, but NAFTA was very good for Mexico in the first years of its uh, uh, implementation, because NAFTA gave Mexico a preferential access to the US. But now that preferential access has a role. Now much more countries have this preferential access to the US. The US in the last few years have negotiated another uh, free trade agreement. So now Mexico doesn't have this preferential uh, uh, access to the US market. So now what we need is to truly uh, create a new paradigm or a new economic partnership. And uh, but we haven't been able to do that. Why so? Because I would say American economic elites now are they more interested in China. Uh, China has become a fierce competitor to Mexico. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and now I would say the image of Mexico in the US is perhaps too much about violence and, 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 order and, and, and crime, and not much about, and they don't see Mexico, they did see Mexico 15, 20 years ago, that there's a lot of economic opportunity. Uh, so the second challenge is, is what are we going to do with the Mexico-U.S. economic integration. We, we're two integrated economies. Uh, 
To give you a sense, for example, there is uh, more than 200 direct flights from Mexico to the U.S. in a daily basis. So we're very well connected to the U.S. And there is this almost $1 billion trade in a daily basis. But still, there's something else we have to do to, to, to continue with, to, to integrate to the U.S. And of course, Mexico has the big challenge of diversifying its foreign markets. Um, and that is proving to be very elusive to Mexico because it's very easy for Mexican exporters to just go next door and to export to the U.S. Okay. So the, the third challenge with the U.S. is about, I would say, about immigration and about the border. We have, there's, between, there's 12 million Mexicans living in the U.S. 10% uh, of the Mexican population lives in the U.S. But there's a Mexico in the U.S. because there's uh, 32 million people, 33 million people in, living in the U.S. of Mexican origin. That is, there's 20 million Americans or 21 million Americans of Mexican origin plus 12 million Mexicans who migrated to the U.S. So it's a huge Mexican country within the U.S. And, uh, and well, the, the, the result of the 2010 census in the U.S. It's, 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 very interesting because the Latino population is growing, it, it, it continues to grow. Now there's 50 million Latinos in the US, that is 50 million people of Latin American origin, and about two thirds, almost three quarters of them are from Mexican origin. And, uh, but still, now the US has become the second largest <laughs> uh, country in the Americas of having people of Latin American origin. So it's, uh, it's uh, well, I would say Brazil is, it, I mean, it's, I mean, after Mexico, uh, which is 112 million, the U.S. have 50 million, but I mean, I'm not counting Brazil because Brazil is of Portuguese origin, and uh, they, they speak Portuguese, but it's really, la the Latinos are, are changing the face of the U.S. There is one, I mean, as, pre as President George Bush the 41st, not, not W, I mean, George Bush, Bush, the father, he used to call the browning of America. And indeed, there is this browning of America in which you're seeing Latinos everywhere as elected officials in every single place, a lot of journalists. And, uh, and, uh, and that eventually, now it's, it's very interesting to see there's four, the U.S. have sent four Latinos to Latin America as ambassadors. And uh, the current U.S. ambassador to Mexico is of Cuban origin. And for example, the, the U.S. ambassador to, to, to Argentina is of Mexican origin. And it's fascinating to see now how, how these Latinos and these Mexicans are really changing things and, uh, in the US, and, and they eventually will really run in the U.S. Uh, diplomacy towards Latin America. But uh, out of those 12 million Mexicans living in the U.S., and John, this is taking a look at that, almost 7 million, they have no documents. That creates a big, a huge problem, because uh, we are treating the Mexican ambassador uh, to Australia, who was for many years, five years, uh, the Mexican general consul in, in Nogales, Arizona, she knows very well that I mean, even though we have the largest consular network in the world, we have 53 consulates. 53 now, at least? 53, I believe. I mean, they, I mean 53 and counting, because they, they, there's always one more. But they, we have 53 consulates in the US, and it's impossible to keep up with the growth of the Mexican population in the US. And it's impossible to be effective in helping Mexicans uh, and in making sure that there's no abuses to the human rights, to the labor rights. Because when you're an undocumented people, when you don't have a, a papers, it's, it's impossible uh, for you to do, do not be uh, abused at some point of time. And, uh, and especially after 9-11, uh, the life for most of these Mexicans is very difficult. Let me tell you that most of these seven million 
uh, illegal Mexicans in the US. We don't like to call them illegal, we call them documented. So sometimes it's so simple to call them illegal. Uh, that's the way the US call it illegal. Uh, but what I want to say here is that most of them, they live in what we call mixed families. families. So that means that at least one member of a family, they are legally into the US. So for example, usually the children are legal in the US and the parents are not. So now, for example, in most places in the US, uh, an illegal person, they cannot get a driving license. But in the US, in most of the places, you, you need to have a car to go to work. And uh, but if they got driving without a driving license, they will be immediately deported to Mexico, almost immediately. And then it's chaos because some part of the family sometimes will remain there with relatives. The father or the mother is being deported to Mexico and they will try to come back to the US. But now it's very dangerous and very expensive to try to come illegally to the US. So it's becoming very problematic. And uh, since the year 2001, Mexico has been asking the US to either to negotiate an immigration agreement or to have the, the US Congress to pass immigration reform. Every, I mean, President Bush and President Obama, they have recognized that the US immigration system is broken, that they need, that they need a new immigration system, but the votes are not there, and the consensus is not there, and the Mexican and the immigration community is suffering a lot. Let me stop there. The second big challenge for, challenge for Mexico in world affairs is Central America, by all means. I will neighbors to this up. Uh, the better we do in the war against organized crime, the worse Central America is doing. Why? Because we're literally exporting a lot of uh, criminals to Central America. The tougher the fight we put into the gangs, the more gangs are coming into Guatemala, into Honduras, into El Salvador, and, uh, and, uh, and that's becoming very complicated now, especially with, with our neighbors, uh, Guatemala, which is a 14 million people country, uh, with a lovely uh, Mayan uh, ancestry, about 50% of Guatemala, they from, from indigenous origin, the Mayans, and they, if Mexico has weak judicial institutions, Guatemala has much more weaker uh, institutions and for us it's very difficult to, put, to keep up and to put up a good fight to this uh, criminal organization for Guatemala is almost impossible. This year Guatemala is facing the presidential election and we're watching because it's, it's the, the governability in Guatemala is to say the least kind of weak. So that's, that's a big priority for Mexico. and. Uh, they say this happened in, 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 in Honduras in a way. Honduras had a lot of problems in the last three years with, uh, uh, with the electoral system. And, uh, and of course, El Salvador, which is uh, a very important uh, uh, Central American country, they have now, finally, after 20 years of rightist and conservative governments, they finally have a leftist government and President Mauricio Funes is doing fairly well. President Obama just visited him, and we gotta make sure that that government does well because it's very important to have, uh, I mean, this uh, Central, tiny Central American country. There's uh, six million Salvadorians living in El Salvador, and two and a half million Salvadorians living in the U.S. And uh, almost one third of Salvadorians live in the U.S. But this is a vibrant country in Central America, they, they're very entrepreneurial and, uh, and, uh, and we badly need that Salvador does well under this leftist government because the, it's very important that Central America and all Latin America to go to left or right to, to, have a, to continue to strengthen its democratic process. And finally, and, and I will close with this, it's uh, for Mexico is the global challenge. We're living in this global world, and Mexico, and especially President Calderón, has decided to be a very responsible and a very and, and, and become a, a key player in world affairs. And, uh, and I would say uh, we're participating in, 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 I would say, the most important groupings and mechanisms in world affairs, like the G20, 
And in the G20 especially, we have become close partners with Australia. And uh, I've been talking in the last few years a lot with Australian diplomats, and I kept on telling them that, for example, uh, for the last uh, meetings of the G20, uh, the Australian diplomats put out these uh, white papers of what they thought that should be done in the, in the last minutes of the G20, and I was telling them, uh, complimenting them, and telling them that President Calderon truly the board and read carefully those uh, white papers because Australia has become perhaps the single most uh, of the single country who has developing ideas and thinking through in how to strengthen the G20 as a, as a group that helps the world not only to come out of the recent economic crisis, but that could become the premier mechanism to have a better economic and financial coordination in world affairs. So this is very important and Australia is very much a leader. And the partnership there with Mexico is fairly good. Mexico has become, and I feel very proud of it, on, on climate change. I mean, this is very much in the heart of President Calderon. I mean, he kept on telling everybody, well, I wish I could have more time to be planting trees instead of combating uh, organized crime, because it's very much in his heart. He believes that the single most important challenge of his generation of politicians is to combat climate change. and that it could explain you why Mexico was able to achieve a very important su success, not only for, for Mexico, but also for the world and for, and for the future of the climate change regime in Cancun uh, last December, because, I mean, after the big failure of Copenhagen in 2009, Mexico last December was able to pass uh, uh, to, to agree into a balanced package of measures and uh, that truly gave the world uh, a lot of confidence in, in, in the multilateral process and in that the, even though it's very elusive and very complicated, but there's ways in which we could eventually come and have a, a truly global accord on combating uh, climate change that is so necessary, especially for the islands of the world especially for the impoverished, impoverished regions of the world, especially for Africa, especially for Central America, and for places like Mexico, and even Australia, that we have a lot of oceans around us. Uh, I, I mean, after being here almost uh, ten, uh, 10 days or so, I, I, I truly believe that, that Mexico and Australia have a big potential to, to be true partners in world affairs. Uh, we share the same democratic values. We share uh, a, I mean, a lot of principles, and, uh, <coughs> and we believe in the multilateral uh, system. So I would say that here, with, in the last few years, Mexico and Australia, we really discovered each other, and I hope in the next uh, few years, and, and, and the role that the actress, Mexican ambassador here will play will be key for this. I hope that, that we, that Australia and Mexico could be the leaders of, of, a, of a world, of, of the new world architecture in which uh, we need uh, of, of, uh, to strengthen the multilateral process. We, have, uh, we need to have better coordination and, 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 and we have to strengthen the UN system. And, uh, and I would say, I, I don't see uh, the energy for this coming from, from the big players like the US or China, but the energy is in places like Canberra, like Mexico City, like Seoul, South Korea, and let me stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm going to